I want to say how thankful I am to God for this occasion that we have and that we can get together like this to spend time in the book of God and to study together and to spend time uh, singing. Appreciate the good songs that's been led and to spend time in prayer. And uh, certainly uh, that's a wonderful thing. I want us to do uh, here is to, we're going to begin here in just a moment, but I want to start with a little bit of an, of an introduction. Several years ago, there was a very poor but a wise preacher, and his name was Johnny Cothran, and he le lived up in Ohio. And uh, he received an invitation from one of the brethren to go to their house. They had been over to Jerusalem around Jerusalem and Israel and in those, those places. He had been there. They had been there. You know, he never had a chance to go, and there's no way he could ever go, but they, could, they went and brought pictures back. And they asked Johnny, they said, would you like to come over and, and look at these pictures? He said, I'd love to. And so uh, he went over, and of course they're showing him their pictures and things, and finally he stopped them and he said this. He said, show me Calvary. And even as he asked the question, he began to weep. And then they showed him some pictures, and then he wept some more. Uh, after this, he looked to them, and he asked them the question. He said, did it so affect you? Now, I don't know the exact picture that he saw. I, don't, I wasn't there, obviously. But perhaps it is that he saw this picture. This was a picture uh, over in Israel. Uh, Jerusalem of a place called Calvary, and, and specifically they called it Gordon's Calvary because this fellow named Gordon found this spot. And you can you can look up toward the top, and there's a, um, a cemetery up there on top. But somebody had said one time, they said, you know, it kind of looks like a skull. And the, the Bible talks about it being a place of a skull. It kind of looks like a skull. They said, well, right here's an eye, you know, eye socket. And here's another eye socket, and right there's the mouth. And so it kind of looked like a skull. And, you know, after years of erosion and other things like this, perhaps it looked more distinct years ago. But people say, well, about right in there, that kind of looks like a skull and that kind of thing. I don't know. Again, I don't know what the man saw. He might have seen this because this is a particular popular place to take tourists and others. But to be honest with you, if you went, um, there we go. Right here's a picture of Jerusalem. And right here is a dome called the Dome of the Rock. And this is where the Muslims set up. Uh, and this is supposed to be over the site of the temple, the old temple that was destroyed by uh, the Romans in 70. And right across here, as, you, as the crow flies, would be actually the spot where Jesus was crucified. Now, it, obviously this is a modern day picture, but if you can go back in time and with your mind's eye think about what this city would have been like back years ago, the city was much, much smaller then. And in fact, the Western Wall would have come down through like this, if you can see, see this cursor, it would have come down through about like this. And this spot is actually outside of the original walls. And so you think about the passage that says that Jesus was crucified outside of the city walls. It wasn't, wasn't inside, he was outside. Then this spot fits it because, again, that, that wall went through like this. And so this is, would have been actually outside of the walls of the city, but still close enough where people could see, and more on that in a moment. But more than likely, this is the actual spot. And that you would have this place, and then, of course, over the years, somebody else has made some type of a church building right here. It's not, it's not Muslim like over here. It's not a Muslim, but it's uh, another group, and they have built some kind of a building right there. Perhaps it's Catholic. I don't know. But people who've been there know, and it's not me. But from what I can tell, this is the spot that would have been the spot where Jesus was crucified. And more on that in a moment, because what affects me is that is the words that Brother Cawthorn used. Whenever he wanted to, you know, see all this, what he said was, show me Calvary. 
And that's really going to be the uh, title for this sermon uh, here this evening. Show me Calvary. What does it mean to show me Calvary? And I got to thinking about that phrase and thinking about what that means and such. And so I want us to to think about this and and, um, just looking at this uh, title. Here he says, show, to show me Calvary. If you show me Calvary, what are you going to show? I want to suggest to you what you're going to show is it's a real place. We live in an age of modernism and in fact, really postmodernism. And it's the idea, postmodernism is the idea that, that really, you know, there's no truth. There's no such thing as truth. And so since we know that the Bible's not true, uh, you know, now let's move forward from there. It's, it's not the matter of, you know, do we know if it's true or not? Do we, uh, that's, that's more, you know, the 1800s and so. But this is now where people uh, treat it as, well, we know the Bible's not true. Therefore, you know, what are we going to do with the Bible? What I want us to understand is it is a real place. It was a real place that really existed. You go in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 27, for example, in Matthew 27 and the verses number 33, it speaks of it uh, as a real actual place. Just turn over there and notice these terms. First of all, Matthew 27, verse 33, uh, he says this. Um, My pages are... Are stuck together. Um, in verse 33, when they were come to a place, a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. Now you're going to read a parallel statement in Mark 15, 22. There again, called Golgotha. Now that's the Hebrew term, Golgotha, that's Hebrew. And you're going to see it also in John 19, 17, where he uses the term Golgotha. And again, it means place of a skull. Luke 23 and verse 33 is different. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter 23, in verse number 33, you're going to see uh, the not the Hebrew term, but actually the Greek term being used. Luke 23 and verse number 33 Notice here what what he says. He says, when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now Luke 23. So here again, it speaks of it. He says, they came to the place. It speaks of it as this is a real place. It really existed. This place, the place of a skull, because that's where all the skulls were. What, what, uh, People smarter than me who have interpreted these words from the original Greek have said that it's because there there are so many dead bodies and there's all these skulls laying around and a bunch of dead bodies and such from so many people being killed and then they just, you know, pull the dead body off and, and maybe just leave it there to rot or whatever. And so it became known as this place of a skull because so many dead bodies and dead bones and so forth laying around. And that's where Jesus has been taken, this very real place to be crucified. As you continue, you see that this place, Hebrews 13, 12, was outside the city walls. And we discussed this a moment ago, but I want you to look at the verse. I want you to see that the Bible speaks in these terms about where Jesus was crucified. Are you turned over there with me? Hebrews 13, verse 12. He says, wherefore Jesus uh, also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Uh, King James says without the gate. Others are going to say outside the gate. Well, there again, like I told you, if you can see this picture very well, you know, the the Western wall is is down through this side. And so this spot where uh, Jesus would have been crucified is outside the city. But it's outside the city, but at the same time, people could still see it. And so you go Mark 15, verse 40, for example, and I know we're going to several places here, back and forth through the New Testament, but please bear with me because of there's so many passages 
that talk about Christ's crucifixion. There's so many passages that talk about the events surrounding it and what happened. Mark 15 and verse 40, there were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, Joseph, and he says Salome. Luke 23, 49 is going to tell you very much a similar thing. So you could have stood, as it were, and, and of course, they're going to get closer. And we read, of course, about the women gathered around the, the cross. But understand, you could stand off far off and still see the cross, still see Jesus right there. They weren't, you know, it wasn't like miles and miles and miles away, but it was far off enough you could stand back and, and see what's going on. You could stand at the gate. You could stand uh, by the walls and or the gate of the walls or whatever you want to do and stand there and see what was happening over there. And that's what we find. He's outside the city walls. They can see him afar off. They're at this place called the Skull Calvary and consistently called a place. You know, it's, it's real. It's actual. And I imagine, uh, I, I, I can't imagine that anyone here, uh, you know, with us right now, assembled on this right now, it would probably deny this. But I'm just saying, you're going to run into people who are going to deny it, say it's not true, say they don't know about it. You know, maybe it's not real. Maybe Jesus really didn't die there. And on and on and on and on. And we need to understand it is a real place. When you say, show me Calvary, you're saying, I want to see this real place. And of course, because of the benefits of uh, photography and so forth, we can even see that yet today. I want you to think about something else. Our brother uh, Cawthron there, he didn't just say, show me Calvary. What he said was, show me Calvary. Now, Calvary, what are we talking about when we're talking about Calvary? Well, I suggest to you that that means it is a historic place. Historic place. Calvary or Golgotha, either, either word is correct was a place where crimes were, criminals were executed, okay? It was a place of execution for crimes. And all the way back in Isaiah 50, and ver I'm sorry, 53 and verse 12, all the way back in Isaiah is a prophecy where it says Jesus was numbered among the transgressors. See, he was numbered among them, among the transgressors. Why, why is that so? Well, it's so because... He was uh, there to be executed. He was there to be taken and there to be killed. This is a historic place. When we see Jesus on the cross, of course, uh, excuse me, there we go, we see two others crucified with him, don't we? And I, I gave you several passages, Matthew 27 and verse 38 Mark 15, Luke 23, John 19. I want us, to, well, I'm in the book of Luke right now. Go back to Luke 23, verse 33. We read this a moment ago. And Luke 23 uh, and verse 33, uh, there he talks about that place called Golgotha and says what? Well, in Luke 23 and verse 33, he says the following. When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and one and the other on the left. So you had two criminals. So yes, when you talk about this place being um, a place of execution, that's exactly what it was. They were being executed for their crimes, and it says so. Go to verse 39. This section, 39 to 43, you should be familiar with. 39 says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, on Jesus, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him and said, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that we are in the same condemnation? Verse 41, We indeed justly, but this man hath, and we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now we're familiar with this, and, and I, I really don't want to get into a sermon about the thief on the cross. Uh, we can if we need to. <clears throat> but um, whenever you think about this, Luke 23, notice the malefactors, the, the, the criminals. And the criminals here, he says, 
He says, we indeed justly. He said, we're in the same condemnation. We're going to be killed and die together today. But we, verse 41, Luke 23, 41, indeed justly, we receive the due reward of our deeds. So they, he recognizes we're wrong. We deserve death. We deserve being punished and being killed for what we've done. We deserve that. And so there were people crucified on either side of Jesus. John 19, 18 says so, and just on and on. But notice this, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four gospel records speak of this event and how that this place was real. Those men were killed. This is the place, by the way, where Jesus uttered, John 19, verse 30, he uttered, it is finished. Jesus uttered what's often been called the seven sayings of the cross. You know, and, and when he talked about, you know, woman, behold thy son, and, and, and behold thy mother, and whenever he talked about, I thirst. And, of course, what we just read, uh, to the thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And on and on. Well, then the last thing you read about here is where he says, it is finished. Uh, Luke includes the statement. I don't have it on the chart, but you can write this down. Luke 23 and verse 46. Notice here what, what's said in this passage. Uh, after, after the thief on the cross and after all that, Luke 23 verse 46. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. It's where Jesus says these things. And like I said, it is finished. It's over. I'm done. I've completed what you told me to do. This is the place, by the way, when you show me Calvary. This historic place is a place where the women gathered unafraid. Now, a moment ago, we read how the women had gathered afar off. All right, so they're standing far off and they're seeing Jesus on the cross and they're seeing these you know, events taking place and, and everything going on. Jumped over to John 19. In John 19, verse 25, and down through verse number 27. All right, so John 19, 25 to 27, here they're stood by the cross of Jesus. All right, so now they moved. A while ago, they are standing afar off watching these things. And like I said, they could have been by the gate they could have been by the wall, the other side of the wall, whatever, and they're watching all this. Now, in John 19 and verse 25, there stood at the cross Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, his disciple took her into his own home. So this is the place where the women gathered, unafraid of what people are going to say. I mean, they stood around close by. There you don't have any question at all that these women are disciples. These women are followers of Jesus. Where are the apostles? At this moment, we don't know. Now, John's going to come up here as we read. Uh, and <coughs> John wasn't too far away because Jesus would give custody, maybe, if that's not the right word, uh, perhaps there's a better word, but he gave the responsibility of caring for his mother. He gave that responsibility to John. So again, John's not far away, but where, is it, where are the other ones? Where's the 10 others? I understand Judas is dead now. So where are the 10 others? Where are they? Well, they weren't around. They'll come up here a little bit later, but they're not around. Peter is over there warming his hands by the enemy's fire and denying Jesus all the time. You remember that? Three times he denied Jesus. And... <coughs> The other ones had been taken away, and or, I'm sorry, sorry, had been taken away. They had run away. They ran away when they saw the possibility of being taken by the soldiers. They're gone. They'll come back later, but they're gone now. And here these women are, and here's Jesus concerned about his mother, and he says, uh, "Woman, behold thy son." Now, when he says that, I believe people get confused about that, and they think that Jesus is saying. Uh, you know, look at me. He's on the cross, nailed to the cross, and he's saying, look at me. I don't believe that's what he's saying. And especially in light of verse 27, where he said, behold thy mother, the same word or same wording, same phrasing. He wasn't saying, look at me. He was saying, behold thy son, 
uh, meaning your son is over there. You know, he's going to take care of you now. John will serve as your son, as the oldest son to take care of you. And then he says, behold thy mother. Well, John already had a mother. You remember, you remember the mother that came to Jesus saying, I want James and John to sit on either side of you in your kingdom. Remember that? John has a mother, a biological mother. But this statement, behold thy mother, means John, you need to be taking care of her. See to her, uh, you know, her needs and so forth. I'm going to be dead. That's what's going on. So whenever he says, behold thy son and behold thy mother, he's, he's talking about John and Mary here and making that right. But Mary, the other Mary and Mary Magdalene and all these folks, they are examples of bravery. They could have been killed. They could have been run out, of, you know, run out of there or anything else or maybe risk the possibility of being crucified themselves. You know this traitor? You know this man that made himself a king? <coughs> All the false statements, you know, that they used. You, he made himself a king and you're, well, you must be a traitor too. And you must be a rebel too. Let's put you on a cross too. And there they gathered, those brave women. Well, moving on. Not only do we see um, about these women gathering unafraid, but we also see, there we go. This is where the centurion confessed. Now, You'll notice here, we were in the book of John, but remember in Matthew 27 and verse 54. I want to go over to Matthew 27 now because the centurion has been watching all this. He's been one that, that's seen Jesus. He's very much aware of what Jesus is doing and what's happening there at the cross and the three hours of darkness and all these things. And when Jesus cries out with a loud voice and then Matthew 27, 54, he says, When the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this is the Son of God. Mark chapter 15, verse 39 says, This was a righteous man. This is the place where the centurion confessed, my friends, I want you to think about that. A centurion means he was a leader of a, uh, he was the, like a general. He was responsible of, for a hundred men, a hundred soldiers served under him. And so he, he had that responsibility, but also he's out here uh, there at, at Golgotha or Calvary and watching these things unfold. He's seen no telling how many crucifixions in his day. I don't know how many. He's seen, no telling how many crucifixions in his day. He's seen violence. He's seen mayhem. He has seen, you know, people just, uh, you know, killed in, in all kinds of ways. And again, no question, he's seen people die as in crucifixion. But when this crucifixion happens, it's different from any other crucifixion that's ever taken place in the history of the world. When this crucifixion happens, there is no doubt this is the Son of God. You talk about a historic place. This is a historic place uh, for, obviously, for what Jesus was doing and bringing about salvation and more than that in a moment. But it's historic for that. It's historic because it's a fulfilled prophecy. It's historic because of, uh, again, where the women have gathered and these women showing their bravery. It's historic for what the centurion confessed, and it's historic because of the great numbers that witnessed this very event. When you think about this, and you begin to read and study, we read how that that the um, well the earth quaked. There's an earthquake. The Bible says you can just back up that the uh, veil in the temple was rent in two, was torn in two, it says. And uh, it was rent, and this is in Matthew 27. I know I have Luke 23 up, and it's there too. But Matthew 27 and verse number 51, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. See, from the top to the bottom. That's significant. Because people witnessed this. They saw that veil being torn. 
Now, if a man had come in there trying to rip and tear at the at the temple veil, number one, they'd probably killed him. All right, it wasn't just anybody allowed in the temple, anyways. And so, someone trying to get in, uh, they'll kill you. Number two, if a man tried to rip the temple veil and and, and rip it in two. He to tore it from the bottom to the top. He's standing on the floor, isn't he? He's, he's on the floor. He would have ripped it from the bottom to the top. But my Bible says, and your Bible says, it was ripped from the top to the bottom. Where is the significance in that? Top to the bottom means God did it. And he ripped that veil open. He tore it in two and he opened up. Made a, made a way by which men can have access to God's throne and to God's forgiveness, to God's mercy seat. That's what was going on. Great numbers witnessed this. The earth quaked. The rocks were rent in two. The graves were open. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now I'm in verse 52 of Matthew 27. Many of these saints, and they came out of the graves. Even after his resurrection, that happened. And they went to the holy city and appeared to many and on and on and on. Great numbers witnessed this event. Great, a huge uh, thing here. Here is the climax, my friend. You talk about show me Calvary. When you show me Calvary, you are seeing the climax of Bible prophecy. God's plan for salvation has been fulfilled in Christ. And then from here, from Golgotha, Christ's body will be taken down, buried in that buried tomb. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb is a new tomb. Nobody had ever, no body had ever been laid in there before. It's brand new. And he goes, uh, Joseph does, and begs for the body. And then him and Nicodemus, remember John 3? Him and Nicodemus go and actually bury, wrap, wrap up the body like it's supposed to be wrapped up, and then put it in that tomb, and then they close up the tomb, and then um, some of the enemies hear about this and so forth, and they want a seal put on. So then there's a seal that's set on the on the the stone that they rolled in front, because they were, they were saying, "Well, we want to make sure that none of the uh, disciples and none of these other folks come and steal the body." And then say he was resurrected. So we want a seal put on it. We want a guard, guard standing there. And so they did. And there was guards there, Roman guards. And the thing was sealed. And then Jesus' body was in that tomb. And there for three days and nights. So that came, of course, after. And there in the shadow of Calvary, you see these things coming about. Till on the first day of the week, the third day, which is the first day of the week, Luke chapter 24 teaches us this, that on that third day, which is the first day of the week, Jesus resurrects. And that tomb is open, not from the outside. That tomb is open from the inside. And then Jesus, of course, leaves that place. The tomb was open, my friends, not, uh, not because Jesus couldn't get out some other way, because he could get out however he wanted to. The tomb was open, and the stone was rolled back, so we could look in. You look in there, and you see an empty tomb. See? All the other great leaders, and all the other leaders of men, whether you're talking about generals, and, and admirals, and all kinds of folks who have led men through the years, religious leaders, people who started their own religions, whether it be Buddha, whether it be Mohammed, whether it be any of these other guys, whenever they died, their grave, the body was put in the grave, and their grave has somebody in it to this day. But the tomb of Christ is empty. So here's Jesus in this historic place, Calvary, dying upon the cross so that you and I can be forgiven of our sins buried in that buried tomb and rising again that's what we see when you show me calvary well we think about this somebody says well that's this is this is good i'm glad you told me about this this is very very interesting 
But now that I know about these events, and now that I know what was going on, and now that I know what was taking place just outside of Jerusalem, what significance, though, does that have 2,000 years removed from the event? 2,000 years later, what significance is there in that? And for that, I want to just say this. What the, the next point of emphasis in that statement, show me Calvary, is this. Show me Calvary. When you show me Calvary, what applications do we make? What do we see in this place when you show me Calvary? Again, we see the historic nature of it, and we understand its reality. But now, 2,000 years removed, what's happening there, or what happened there, that has any effect on my life today? That's the key. Isn't it? What is it? Can I suggest to you, first of all, what we see in this place is love. Calvary is a place of love. And you say, I never expected him to say that. <laughs> uh, how in the world could you call a place of a skull a place of love? How in the world could you call a place of death and blood and gore and mayhem, how could you call that a place of love? Remember Romans 5, 8? He says there, <coughs> that God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Yes, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 15, verse 13 is on the screen as well. You look there with me. Greater love hath no man than this. Do I need to finish that verse? Think about it. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John fifteen thirteen. You talk about Calvary, friends, that's a place of love. The love seen at Calvary is felt by us even to this good day. You know what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved us. God loved us to this degree. That's what so loved has to do with. He loved us to this degree that he gave his only begotten son. There's love there. There's something else we see at Calvary is sacrifice. This is a place of sacrifice. Remember, go back in John chapter 1 with me. Remember John's description. I'm talking about John the Baptist now. John the Baptist's description of Jesus. I want you to look there and see his description. John 1 verse 29, when John the Baptist sees Jesus uh, there, he says uh, at Bethabara beyond Jordan, John was baptizing there at Bethabara beyond Jordan, and he says the next day he came to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 36, he looked upon Jesus as he walked, and he said, here it is again, Behold the Lamb of God. Later on in Revelation 5, verse 6, Jesus is described as that Lamb as it had been slain. And even in Revelation 13, verse 8, talks about that <coughs> Jesus is... <laughs> the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ was sacrificed because of man's sin, because of your sin, because of my sin. And through his death, we can be free from sin. What do I see in this place 2,000 years later is sacrifice that makes my salvation possible. That's what I see. Show me Calvary. And when you show me Calvary, I'm going to be impressed that that what Christ did means everything to me. You know what else this place was? This was a place of shame. And don't you ever forget it. In Hebrews chapter 12 and the first two verses. Hebrews chapter 12, turn with me over there. And the first two verses. He says, and it's talking about Christ, 
and how that wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he said, endured the cross. Now watch this. Endured the cross, watch, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The shame is associated with the cross. <clears throat> you say, how so? Well, think about it. The cross is the equivalent of the electric chair. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of the firing squad or a hangman's noose. In, in more modern times, it's the equivalent of the lethal injection. All right? When somebody is, is put on a cross and killed, uh, well, ex for the, with Jesus being the exception, obviously, uh, when someone's on the cross and being killed, it's because you've committed a horrible, heinous crime. You know what? And that's what the other thief said. Remember that, that thief said, we're here justly. In other words, it was justice that put us here. We're supposed to be on the cross. We're supposed to be dying because of what wickedness we did and how we broke the law. Okay? So <laughs> it's a place of sh associated with shame because here's somebody who's uh, committed these horrible crimes you know, rebellion and, and uh, stealing and, and, and being a traitor and so forth. I mean, look at the things that Barabbas did, and you'll, you'll see the picture. But that being the case, being put on the cross then is a, is a place of shame. You know what? It was a shame. It was mockery, cruelty, beatings, and all of this. And here you are nailed to a cross for a crime that you didn't commit, but it doesn't matter because you're going to be up there and then you're going to die for it. That's Jesus. And here he is on the cross, his arms outstretched, nailed, na feet nailed down. <coughs> and this, and then imagine your own mother. Here is your mother that stands at the foot of that very cross to watch you bleed and watch you die. You talk about shame. You talk about that, and 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 then just just go forward from there. Here's people, uh, you know, preaching and and so forth, and and they tell tell these folks maybe uh, out in the the places where the Gentiles were, especially, and <coughs> you're talking to them about salvation, and then to speak of this and somebody says oh well i'm really interested tell me more about your savior well you know uh you know he was on the earth and he taught and they were, and and I've, I've told you some of the things that he's taught and he had miraculous powers and they're like well yeah yeah i want i want to meet him i wait well you can't meet him uh, uh he's dead he already died uh you know but he left us this message and we're giving the message to you now can you imagine a Gentile listening to this go, oh, well, he's already dead. Yeah, he's already dead. He's ascended back to his father. He resurrected. He's sent back to his father. And you say, oh, well, well, how did he die? Oop. What? Yeah, yeah. Well, how did he die? What are you going to say? Like I said, it, it'd, be the, it'd be equivalent of someone today talking about a savior and a Messiah that they had. And you say, how'd they die? Well, he died of lethal injection here a couple of years ago, you know, uh, down in Texas. And, and uh, he died of lethal injection, you know, but, but you ought to be following him. That's kind of what was going on then, too. Well, what happened to him? How'd he die? Well, he died of, um, uh, <laughs> well, the crucified, <laughs> crucified him. But crucifixions, that's for the people who can't do anything with. Well, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, for a crime he committed. He was, he was innocent. You know, well, everybody says they're innocent, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> when you talk about this shame, it's a very real thing, isn't it? And so here are folks who see this, and here's Jesus with his own mother, and here's these folks gathered around. And then he's going to die on the cross. He suffered shame, though we wouldn't have to. This place is a place of redemption. 
And I hope that is made very clear. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. He makes that possible. And that blood that is shed, that was shed, makes our salvation possible. We're redeemed, not redeemed by with, with silver and, and gold and, and all of that, received by the vain tradition of your fathers, but with, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And another thing, when you show me Calvary, you're going to show me the place of hope. <coughs> you say, how so? Look in Romans chapter 8 with me. I'm sorry, Romans 5. I said 8, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 5 and the first two verses. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope. This was a place of hope. I recognize that's hard to see when you, when you look around and see all the skulls. And I recognize that's hard to see when you see the blood and you see the pain and you see the, the people as the Bible describes, my bones are out of joint and I'm poured out like water. And the twisted, uh, disfigured people it's hard to see that. But right amongst all of this was the Son of God who came to this world, who died upon the cross, who made salvation possible for every one. And because he went to the cross, because he suffered in that way, he made hope possible. You wouldn't have hope had Jesus not gone to the cross and died there. You show me, Calvary, these are the things that I need to see. And then I need to respond in kind. I need to respond by becoming a Christian. You know what? Because Jesus came to this world and because he died upon the cross and because he suffered and he made salvation possible, then I need to believe in Christ as the Son of God. I need to repent of my sins and confess my faith in Christ and be baptized for the remission of my sins. That's what I need to do. And then... Uh, live faithfully for the Lord. Serve Him and follow Him and, and there to the world, let the world see that I am the friend of Jesus. I'm going to do what He says and I'm going to live for Him. What Jesus did for me and what He made possible for me, I will respond to by giving my life for Him. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15. You know what? If you've fallen away, you started out right, and you did those things, and you started out and going the right direction, but you have fallen away, why don't you come back to God? You can repent of what you've done, and you can uh, repent of those things. You can come back to God. You can confess, make, uh, confess those sins, and pray God's forgiveness. We stand ready and willing to help you in any way that we can. We'd love to talk to you about this, love to baptize you into Christ, or to pray with you, to pray for you, that you might come back to the Lord. And we're available. Uh, me, uh, any of the elders here, our deacons, anyone, just call us. We'd love to talk to you, love to study with you. You can call me anytime, day or night. Call me, and like I said, call, call any of us, and we'll be glad to baptize you into Christ if that's what you so desire, or to pray with you, to pray for you as an erring child, to return back to God. And we would love to do that and love to uh, help you in whatever way we can. Don't delay and don't put that off. There's, there's no other way. Jesus has done all that he's going to do. And it's time for me to respond and you to respond. Think seriously about these things, my friends.